Thanks, Melissa. So welcome everyone uh, to our uh, March meeting. Um, item one on the uh, agenda is the roll call. I'll ask Melissa, Melissa to call the roll. Present. Mr. Haynes for Treasurer Moss. Here. Mr. Prince. Mr. Russell. Present. Mr. Fiegels for Secretary Sims. Here. Ms. Sotelo. Here. Director Velasquez. Here. Dr. White. Here. Mr. Williams. Here. Ms. Ramirez Lazad for Director Estefa. Ms. Peralt for Director Step Stepenshaw. Ms. Johnson Hall. Good morning, I'm here. Thank you. Chair, we do have a um, quorum. Yeah, thank you. Next uh, item up is approval of the minutes from our February meeting. Uh, minutes from uh, the January 25th board meeting have been provided in the package. I'll entertain a motion and second to approve the, the minutes. Mr. Chair, I'd like to move uh, both sets of minutes. We also have the February 21st uh, minutes in the agenda packet. Correct. So we'll. I know I'm step jumping, back. jumping a little ahead, but I know that we have an aggressive schedule today. And we do. <laughs> so let's uh, uh, approve minutes for, for our January and our February. Uh, I'll second. Thank you. So our item three, um, we'll have our uh, executive director comments. Thank you, Dr. White. I am, all right, I am getting my notes together, but while I'm doing that, I'd like to say I'm really excited to see you all here today. This is going to be a really riveting meeting, I believe, today. Um, and um, I wanted to especially thank you. Usually you give us three hours, three or four hours of your time, and today you're giving us all day. So we really do consider this a very special moment, and uh, I wanted to make sure that I expressed my sincere thank you for that. Um, I'll keep this short because we have so many important discussions to get to, but I did want to introduce someone and then do a brief overview of some recent events that I've attended. I am so thrilled to introduce you to Meji Tabar, who was appointed last week by Governor Newsom as Calatafe's new Director of Legislation. Meji stopped by to meet us, a few, a few of us this morning, and there she is. <laughs> um, we're just delighted to have her. She is a, a currently serving as the Principal Consultant at the California Senate Housing Committee and we appreciate her taking the time to come over. Meji previously worked at the Department of Housing and Community Development in the positions of data research manager and senior housing specialist from 2019 to 2022. Um, that essentially means that she worked on a lot of great things, but specifically the, the state's housing plan. She was in a leadership role there. So um, she's got a set of skills that I think we're going to truly uh, thank you for training her, Director Velasquez, <laughs> and giving her over to us. We're going to really be happy to take advantage of those skills. So on to the events that I've attended. Um, I started off in San Francisco alongside Chair Cervantes and um, staff uh, for the HFA Roundtable. I mentioned that I was attending this last month, but now that it has happened, I just wanted to thank Morgan Stanley and Oric for hosting. We will hear from Oric's uh, Justin Cooper later in our workshop. And I'll just add that it was such a valuable gathering of HFAs and financial organizations. I sincerely hope that we can do it again, and especially if we could do it again in San Francisco, California, because usually it takes place in New York. 
And I'll just add that it was such a, val a valuable gathering of financial or organizations. Um, I was particularly impressed with who showed up and um, they were able to bring in folks from all over the country. Mass Housing was represented, Idaho, uh, all the way to, the, uh, to New York. And so it was just a wonderful place for us to talk and uh, about how the industry is going as well as some of the things that we might want to share with them and, and, and sort of have this camaraderie with other HFAs makes, us, makes it a very special time for us. Um, I followed up with that by attending the NCHSA Legislative Conference in Washington, D.C., along with CalHFA Director of Enterprise Risk Com and Compliance, Rebecca Franklin, as well as Melissa Flores, Gail Tatiama, and our new TCAC and CITLAC Director, Marina Wyatt. During the conference, I had a chance to speak with Congressman Jimmy Panetta, who is very passionate about affordable housing. <coughs> and our group also took the opportunity to meet with a representative from the U.S. Treasury and staff members uh, for representatives Maxine Waters, Judy Chu, Mike Thompson, Michelle Steele, Pete Aguilar, and David Valadeo. Um, that's, that was particularly special because, as you may recall, that was Super Tuesday and we were all voting, so for them to give us some time was really quite special. After D.C., I went to, straight to Long Beach for the Housing California Annual Conference, which is always a great event, but I have to say uh, that they, it was a great event times 10. Um, and I think that both members, Russell and White, who also attended, would have agreed with me. It was really amazing to be there. But was, what was even more amazing was to see our new secretary in action. Um, I was so proud to be there, to hear her voice. Um, she spoke on the panel and she delivered uh, remarks at the Black Developers Forum, so she was doing double duty. <laughs> and uh, it was just amazing to hear her words, her voice, and um, I was just so inspired by that. Um, I also had an opportunity to, <clears throat> to sit on a panel with Director Velasquez and I also got the honor of taking the stage after a speech by Attorney General Rob Bonta, um, where we explored housing justice and other topics along with direct, the directors of Cal, ICH, and the Strategic Growth Council. So it was really nice to have all the state leaderships represented at one time and to, um, again, another proud moment for me uh, to be a part of such a wonderful team. Additionally, I have just one more item that I want to touch upon before I hand it back to uh, our substitute chair, um, and that is the California Dream for All. As you know, the second round of our shared appreciation loan program will be using a randomized selection process to ensure an equitable distribution of the funds. First generation home buyers will be registering for a chance at a voucher starting on April 3rd, and the portal will be open until April 29th. This timeline means that we are deep in our marketing and outreach right now, and that includes some really great resources that are now available on the website. If you haven't already checked out our video library, I encourage you to do so. It's great. I've seen many of the videos myself, and um, I'm really excited about what's to come. We also appreciate the efforts that our board members have made to amplify the awareness in this program. I got to give credit to a lot of folks, but uh, uh, our director, Noriena, has just been outstanding in her efforts in connecting us to various communities, not just in the state of California, but nationally. So thank you for bringing that, uh, that presence to our work. It, I, I think that it actually validates that we are, we're doing the right thing and, and in the right direction. Um, I also have to give credit to um, our Deputy Housing Director, Sasha, who's not, Sasha Kurgan, who is here, but she's just been masterful in helping us to, um, in the direction of our outreach and connecting us with various affinity groups to really make sure that we hit our targets uh, and are more successful in delivering to folks who were underrepresented in the first round. I know we are all excited to get, uh, to be getting this to the stage where we are. Um, I'm especially excited for the home buyers who we're going to help. Um, and so um, that's all I have for today. Uh, and thank you 
Thank you all for your time. Thank you, Director Johnson Hall. Um, Director White. Yeah. Sure. I would like to acknowledge that um, Board Member Cabildo has arrived. Thank you. Um, as you all know, we we have a full agenda today, and we're gonna start with the business items first, um, and then get into our annual workshop. Um, each of our speakers uh, will set the stage for a facilitated s uh, s session by offering information and perspectives on the ho housing finance ecosystem, including the role of Cala Chefe in the marketplace. We estimate that this will end around four. Um, if I'm still in this position before Jim gets here, we will we'll try to um, do that uh, a little before four, but um, we're gonna maintain the efficiency. Um, we're, we're hopeful that all board members uh, will participate fully uh, in this day. Uh, I know Johnson, uh, Director Johnson Hall and her staff have um, put together an amazing agenda, and so we're, we're expecting just full participation from the board. Um, I'm gonna move on to item four. Uh, this is an action item for approval of, of loan commitment for Meridian Family Apartments, uh, Resolution 24-08. I believe Shantae's, there we go. Can you guys hear me? Or does it need to be quiet? <coughs> Can you hear me? Okay, thanks. Thank you, um, Director White. Good morning, everyone. My name is Shante Spears, and I am the Deputy Director of Multifamily Programs. I am joined this morning by members of my team, uh, Steve Gallagher, who is our Housing Finance Chief, Jennifer Beerwood, and Kevin Brown, who are Housing Finance Officers. <coughs> Before I get started with the approval for this request, I'd like to provide a few points for context. The Meridian Family Apartments development will be the ninth and final MIP 20, 2023 permanent loan loan um, to come before the board for approval. As you know, we had a total of 12 de developments for MIP 2023 for the program year. And the board has previously approved eight of those 12 <coughs> developments. The remaining three loans will be or have been approved by executive director under board delegated, her board delegated authority to approve permanent loan commitments up to 15 million. As you know, these permanent loan commitments come at the tail end of the development process, but prior to construction start. For the 2023 MIP program year, all 12 developments have received initial commitments from Cal HFA and were submitted as applications to SIDLAC and TCAC in April of 2023. All have also received bond cap and tax credit allocations from both SIDLAC and TCAC in August of 2023. Since that time, these developments have been underwritten for financial feasibility and long-term economic viability by the College of Ace staff. They have been approved by College of Ace Internal Senior Loan Committee and by College of Ace Executive Director, Tina Johnson. So let's get on with today's requests. Next slide. Next one. Thank you. Meridian Family Apartments is being submitted for your approval of board resolution number 24-08, which will approve permanent financing for the development with a $70. million permanent loan provided by the Cal HFA tax exempt permanent loan program and inclusive of HUD risk sharing. Cal HFA will also provide a $4 million subordinate loan via the mixed income subsidy <coughs> loan program. The Mer Meridian Family Apartments development will be a 233 unit large family apartment property to be built in San Jose. There will be 1,795 square feet of retail space on the ground floor, but this will not be part of College of Bay's collateral. Of the 233 units, two units will be set aside for on-site management. 73 of the units will be subsidized by HUD via the project-based project voucher program 
which will be managed by Santa Clara County's Housing Authority. Of those 73 HUD units, 35 of those units will provide housing to chronically homeless veterans through, HUD -VASH, through the HUD-VASH program, and the remaining 38 units will support large families. The permanent loan was underwritten at a 40-year amortization with a 17-year term, and the MIP loan will be coterminous with that perm. I'd like to get into some highlights of the development. The development is a mixed income, mixed use development with one six story building. It will be five stories over podium with, two level park, with a two level parking structure, one underground and one at ground level. Rents will be restricted between 30 to 70% of the Santa Clara County area median income, which will result in rental rates which are 16 to 66 percent below market rate based on the current appraisal. The developer will be Rome Development Corporation. The construction lender will be Citibank. The e equity investor will be Hudson Housing Capital. And the proposed property management company will be FPI Management. The develop development's financial structure will include financing from tax exempt bonds. 4% uh, federal uh, tax credits and state tax credits. And of course, our, the agency's tax exempt bond and mixed income uh, funding. Pacific Housing Inc., whom is also the managing general partner of the ownership entity, will be providing tenant services to uh, families, which will include adult education, health and wellness, financial literacy, and after school programs. The Santa Clara Housing Santa Clara County Housing Authority will be appointing a housing program supervisor to the property to oversee the veteran um, VASH program. The property will also ha have an appointed supervisorial social worker from the Department of Veteran Affairs uh, to also manage the HUD VASH team and to provide case management services to veteran tenants. The City of San Jose is also providing a density bonus agreement that will not add units to the development, but it will allow for concessions on parking and setbacks that the development needed to fulfill the design requirements set by the City of San Jose's planning department. College of Bay has experience with all members of the development team, finance team, and property management teams. There are three primary exceptions uh, to College of A's underwriting standards that merit board attention. The first, and we have heard these in the past, uh, the uh, pro projects that have come forward um, with regard to residual receipts split. The tax credit investor is requiring that payment of deferred development fee be prioritized over residual receipt lenders. <coughs> this will result and 93% of surplus cash being used to pay down the deferred developer fee through year 13, and the remaining 7% will be available to pay down College of A's MIP subsidy loan, at least through years one through nine. However, that payment structure will change in year 10 um, and increase to 50% through years 10 through 13. This is an exception to California. College of A's underwriting standards. However, it is re recommended by multifamily to meet current market investor requirements. The second underwriting exception is for the dens density bonus um, from the city of San Jose. They are requiring it, it be recorded in first position, senior to the College of A bond re regulatory agreement, the MIP regulatory agreement, and the first deed of trust. This is not an unusual locality requirement, and as such, College of A and the City of San Jose will execute a standstill agreement prior to the perm loan closing. This is also recommended given that College of A will have a requirement for the standstill and given that the density bonus regulatory agreement will not have foreclosure rights. The third exception um, has to do with the valuation of the appraisal. The appraisal that we received uh, represented a mixed-use development, which includes commercial and retail income for the income, cost, and sales approach. This amount is not nominal and does not affect the overall financial feasibility of the development. However, um, we are going to ask that an updated appraisal 
that does not include the commercial and retail uh, income be provided prior to closing. I'm going to move on to um, a few items that were identified by staff as weaknesses and the mitigants for that. The first is overall crime in the primary market area is higher than the local MSA and the national average. Additional security measures are part of the budget and include intercom entry and security cameras throughout the, throughout the building. Second, a phase one did identify environmental issues that include elevated levels of arsenic and lead above the regional water Co quality control board's environmental screening levels for direct human exposure in the surface soil. The development has budgeted approximately $900,000 to address these issues and evidence of environmental <coughs> concerns will be required as a prerequisite to closing of the College of Bay permanent NIP loan. The third, as a part of our economic analysis for the development, a stress test was completed on the cash flow scenario. And this is done to assess the ability of the property to repay remaining PERM and MIP loans um, at the maturity date. The exit analysis does show that cash flow um, will be able to support the loan <coughs> um, with a increased interest rate that's 3% higher and a cap rate that's 2% higher. Based on this analysis, the subject property cash flow would be sufficient to repay the entirety of our PERM loan at maturity. However, there will be a $470,000 um, MIP balance remaining with principal and interest. This is highlighted as a weakness to elevate attention to the fact that market dynamics do play an integral role in the success of all MIP properties. It would be very unlikely that the stress scenario of an increase to both the interest rate and the cap rate would happen dually based upon historic performances of the multifamily market here in California. However, it does give an indication of worst case scenarios for underwriting purposes. The next weakness that was identified is we had previously in this presentation discussed the density bonus um, agreement which will be in the first lien position and just stating that it's identified as a weakness as well. Lastly, the development is located in a flood zone, uh, flood zone D, which according to FEMA falls into a category of areas which ha may have possible risk of flooding. Flood insurance will not be required given that it is not mandatory per our College FA flood insurance requirement or for the minimum building requirements established by FEMA. In summary, approval of board resolution 24-08 is requested to allow College of A to commit to a $70.5 million tax exempt permanent loan and a $4 million MIP subsidy loan. And now I would be happy to answer questions. Hi, <laughs> uh, I'm going to pass this on to uh, uh, Director Cervantes. Thank you very much, yeah. Director White, for taking charge and getting us going here. I really appreciate that. Thank you very much. Um, and I, do, I did see some hands raised. Uh, Director Sotelo. Thank you very much for the presentation. I really appreciate um, going through the weaknesses um, as outlined in the report. That was very helpful. Yeah. Um, one of the areas that I had questions about but you, you um, didn't really mention was the recycled bonds um, that were substituting the, tax, the taxable debt of $44 million with $40 million of, of uh, recycled bonds. Um, how is that structured and um, if you can tell me a little bit more about that. Okay. I don't think we have recycled bonds on here. Um, it just, uh, let's see. In the staff report, it mentions... There's going to be a taxable. Okay. Okay, so we gained... Part of this request is giving us approval to swap out if we need to put in the recycled bonds. Okay, 
so, but you're not putting in the recycled bonds. You just want the authority to do that? Absolutely, if we need to when it comes to closing. And 40 million is, is a considerable amount of recycled bonds. Yes. How many, how much in recycled bonds do we hold now? And are we able to? I'm going to, uh, to ask our yeah. director of finance. We actually multifamily don't keep track of that. Uh, we work in conjunction with the financing department. Oh, I see. Um, okay. when, when those requests come up. But we can get you an answer if you really, I will make sure to get that to you. Yeah. Okay. It's just if, if we're going to substitute that out, we just need to understand that structure a little bit better. Okay. Because the recycled bonds have a different dynamic than the tax, taxable do. I understand. Bonds. We will get we'll get you that information. Okay. Director uh, Satello, you mm -hmm. bring up a really good important point, so I want to underline that a little bit. Um, the reason that we ask for the flexibility is that part of our overall job <coughs> is to manage interest rate risk mm -hmm. and to make sure that we are bringing the greatest benefit to uh, Cal HFA and uh, obviously to the bottom line. And so we have several levers that we would traditionally use. Um, and that just happens to be one of them. Um, and so we, what we are asking for here is the ability to use whatever lever we need, <laughs> and recycle bonds being one of those, uh, to ensure that we gain the greatest, that we manage uh, the greatest yield and the greatest risk associated at the time that the deal actually closes. So if we could just put a report back on that and then maybe, um, you know, get a report as to our ability to access uh, the recycled bonds, you know, what we have available. I know uh, Kate was working on a full-blown program associated with that. I so appreciate you bringing that up, uh, Director Sotelo, and we would be happy to do that. I think there's some other questions. <coughs> Uh, yes, if I may. Yes, please. Um, and, you know, as always, I you know, look at these, uh, we, we see the tip of the iceberg in terms of the deals that we actually approve here. And so each one of these deals to me is it, it helps illuminate uh, various policy aspects of, of our work. And so please forgive me if I get into some detail. But it just to me, as we have a discussion later on today about priorities, goals, uh, policies, I think there's a couple of examples I want to highlight that I think are worthy of consideration. Uh, first off, let me just say it's a marvelous to get three bedroom apartments in this particular community and the pricing levels we're seeing. It is a godsend to the community and the families mm -hmm. who will get to live there. So I want to make sure that's the, the box in which all these other comments are, are delivered in. Um, I did want to ask, and this may sound really small, but there's a, a locality, special locality tax that got that added that changed. It was not in the original deal. It's only $7,600, but we're also seeing a reduction in resident services of almost $10,000. Mm -hmm. And so I'm ask, I'm curious, what is the locality tax? Yeah, you know, we have some representatives from Rome Development Corporation. Um, I'd like to ask them to step up to maybe <coughs> shed some light on that particular question. Um, we have uh, Stephen Amani and Brett Grum from Rome Development. Hi, uh, Brett Grant. I'm uh, Vice President Acquisitions and Operations at Rome. Um, but yes, the taxes you're talking about, those are special assessments that are involved with property that came about as we continue to dive into it. So there are special assessments that we are not going to be exempt from. Okay, so it's an assessment, a special assessment Correct. district that you participate in. Correct. Okay. And in terms of the, the reduction in the services budget, we are providing the exact same services. This was, we have a, a long time nonprofit partner who is also our service provider that we've worked with and we're working with them to get that reduction to sort of make up for that that increase in the taxes as well to help the the project continue to pencil okay no and thank you and I, what I what highlights for me is that that what we provide is not just housing it is of course the human services that go with that and it's absolutely mm -hmm. critical uh, especially families working in an environment like that where there are, there are job opportunities, but how do you connect to the financial mm -hmm. mainstream? Yeah. And 24 hours a week is what I saw for the families in this overall uh, plan, plus the veterans or services there. But I just want to highlight that we should be seeking, you know, the highest <coughs> quality of services in all the projects that we support. And I'll leave it there as a, a recommendation in terms of policy. 
Um, I would also say, you know, I'm going to go back to, you hear me talk about greenhouse gases a lot, uh, climate change. Uh, you know, San Diego just got pummeled with historic flooding because of something we've never seen before. So you know, you know it is very real. Um, I feel like we are not, and this is something I definitely want to pick up in the policy discussion later, is talk more about greenhouse gas emissions. Things like, and it may sound oblique, but again, I'm, going, I'm retreating to my architecture space where I feel comfortable, is the design of the sidewalks. When you talk about getting, reducing a setback from 10 to 7 feet, most of you probably walk the streets here, 10th, 11th, 12th, et cetera. Those have 15 to 20 foot sidewalks next to seven story buildings and they feel like you wanna be there. When you narrow to seven feet a setback along a, you know, a building like this, along a busy roadway, you never create the, the streetscape, the life, uh, the eyes on the street, the actual crime prevention through environmental design. And so we have a high crime area, narrowing right of ways. These are things I would hope that we would look at is, is hold up to some higher standards I recognize you're, you're trying to maximize the benefit to the community through housing. The city is allowing it. We have a chance to maybe intervene as policymakers in how we underwrite projects to uphold higher standards of urban design. And again, not on this project. Don't get don't 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 get nervous. I'm using this as an example for for the future um, projects. And then um, I love uh, you know the, the separation of the the, the units uh, the the condo. Um, <laughs> Obviously, the remediation adds cost per unit. I think Director Lamone may have questions about mm. that. Um, I will, and I will leave it there. But uh, thank you for for the work that you're doing, and I hope that we, as a board, will find ways to uh, make better long-term decisions. Because once you set set a, a line of a building that is 55 to 100 years, we have defined the public right of way, the public sphere. And if it doesn't support the kind of activity we want in civic life, it never will. And it adds up over time, block by block. So I would like us to be setting the highest possible bar when we approve projects. Your project is beautiful, and I will be supporting it when it comes to a vote. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you, Director Russell. Director Limon. Thank you, Chair Cervantes. And I'm going to echo uh, Director Russell that uh, it was remarkable to see the cost per unit in Santa Clara County. Uh, so commend you on that. Uh, two items from an environmental standpoint that I was um, I was concerned about is is in the environmental review findings uh, there there were elevated levels of arsenic and I know that there's significant money that's been allocated to for remediation for that but what are the steps that you're taking to ensure that there isn't um, impact to the community while the building and the construction is taking place. Um, or you know how how credible are the companies that you're using for the remediation? Uh, what are the steps that you're using? Everyone, I'm this is I'm Stephen Imami, Vice President, Room Development. Mm -hmm. So um, we're actually um, not fully submerged in the subterranean parking. So we brought that out to save cost, to be competitive, um, and be able to to get to where we are today with the project. It's uh, five years in the making, so we had um, environmental impact reports. We went through a year of that study and um, went through the state and city's recommended um, consultants that uh, they have on their short list of qualified representatives to, to perform those studies and, and ultimately to perform the work. But the reason I mentioned that we aren't fully submerged is it's a lot, a lot less uh, impactful from an environmental standpoint or from a remediation standpoint because we're not mass excavating, you know, uh, 15, 20, 30 feet into the ground um, and therefore having to encapsulate it or, or something like that um, or off haul it and rail it out of state. So the levels, from my understanding, are manageable um, and while they sound scary, they are. Um, not as harmful and the way that we're able to remediate them will be per the state's laws and regulations so shouldn't have an impact and i will say that rome development as a company has really um, been on the cutting edge and pioneering um, uh, green buildings uh, lead certified um, and which will this project will be um, we were actually the first developer of a lead certified platinum affordable housing project in San, uh, downtown san diego about 15 years ago. Um, so it's definitely um, near and dear to us to build a quality product, but also take into consideration the effect of the environment and community. And we've been recycling and doing things that we can, taking measures um, 
for 30 years before it was kind of, uh, you know, the mainstream or requirement. <coughs> so I hope that answers your question. Thank you. And I had one more question. Um, and then in terms of um, not deciding to take on flood insurance because mm -hmm. it's not required, I mean, Director Russell and I in San Diego just went through massive floods mm -hmm. uh, in areas that were not flood zones. Um, so what are the mitigation strategies to deal with, with the flood risk of the project? Um, our architect would probably be better at uh, answering those questions, but I know that we won't have any units in at risk, any of the residents or their units. The parking garage, as I said, is on ground level, uh, the podium. So um, proper drainage and just, you know, our ability, since we're not in a water table, um, it should all uh, drain and, and, and be safe of any kind of ca catastrophic event, even at a 100-year uh, flood zone. Or event. And, and like you said, most importantly, there are no residential units on the ground floor that would be yeah. impacted with that. Yeah. Thank you. And if I could piggyback on uh, one of Director Lemon's questions on the environmental issue. So before we step in with a permanent loan, uh, we're looking for some form of environmental clearance. Could someone describe that? Like, we're not going to be in this until that happens. What is it that we're looking for and what assurance do we have going in? as to what our interests are safeguarded as, uh, as the lender. So typically when there are issues uh, regarding the environmental or the soil, that Santa Clara County has a, a program and the developers will have to go through and get that um, actually approved through that body. Um, and we will require that they have that with a full clearance before we close. So it's a certificate from uh, a consultant Santa Clara or, County. or the county? Yes. Exactly. But they have a department that they actually, when things like this come up, you, they're going to have to submit their plan and everything. And the county is going to have to sign off and make sure that everything is clear um, and provide that to us or through the developer. So we will need to see that before we will close. Okay, so it's county sign off then? Yes. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, great. Sorry to interrupt, I think I, no Director problem. Williams, you had a question. Um, yes, well, um, one of my questions was just addressed, and that's building the project in the flood zone yeah. uh, when we're having uh, serious climate adjustment issues. Uh, and it's <laughs> great to hear that none of the residents are located on the first floor, but if their cars mm -hmm. are located, uh, uh, mm -hmm. the loss of vehicles in a, in, in a flood uh, could be quite catastrophic to the owners of those vehicles. But so is it, is it that you chose, just chose not to go that route to get flood insurance or because of other issues, the insurance was difficult to obtain. Yeah, and, and we are still in, in talks with our insurance agent about the possibility of it, but um, there's a fine balance with these projects of making them financially feasible mm -hmm. um, yeah. and then dealing with the risk involved as well. Um, and so we are still in talks, as I said, but it is, it is something we're, we're looking at. Um, yeah, I, I understand the concern. Okay. My other question was related to the retail space. I know that uh, in urban uh, markets, it's traditional to have retail somewhere included in the project. What has been you all's experience with finding um, businesses who would want to occupy those spaces? I understand that you'll be requesting a uh, market study or an evaluation that excludes uh, the retail. Uh, but what's been you all's experience with filling those retail spaces once a project is complete? Yeah, as, as you mentioned, many of the projects, especially nowadays in, in a city and an urban environment, it's a requirement to have some portion of retail there. Mm -hmm. um, so we have multiple buildings that do have retail on the ground floor, um, and we've been successful in filling those, uh, those spaces. Um, most recently in a South San Francisco project, 
filled that space with a, a, a UPS store, for example. It's, it's a low intensity use, uh, provides benefit to the tenants as well. Um, so we, we have been successful. We haven't had an issue where uh, actually a space since vacant. Um, so yeah, not, not too, too bad so far. So we're, we're hopeful, especially in this area in San Jose, I don't think we're gonna have an issue filling that. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Great, and uh, Director Henning. Uh, and I, I hate to beat a dead horse about this, but uh, being in a floodplain, particularly again because of the emergencies, mm -hmm. is there is there any intent to notify the uh, residents that their property will be at risk in that flood zone? Yeah, we we could zone zone D is an unspecified unspe zone uh, where studies haven't been completed. Um, so yes, that that could be. A, We'll talk to our management team and see if that's part of the onboarding process, but that is a... Because I, I, I appreciated your comment that there is a fine balance in trying to make things pencil yes. out, but yeah. if you're asking the residents to put their property at risk, yeah. they should at least know what the risk is. It makes a lot of sense, yes. Thank you. Yeah, we'll talk to our management team about that. Thank you. Thank you, Director Henning. And uh, Director Sotelo? Um, thank you very much. Uh, this is more for staff. Um, and again, this is something that will probably come up in our policy discussion once again. I just wanted to note, um, with a $20 million developer fee on a project, 16 million of which is gonna be deferred and uh, senior to our MIP uh, repayment, I just wanna be conscious of that number and you know, really, um, you know, it, it is a policy implication for us not to get our full repayment of the MIP um, there's 416,000 left at the end of our 17-year term. So um, as we go to final underwriting, again, we'll, we'll be discussing the exemption uh, as a policy measure, but because this is an exemption of the policy in this project, I just want to uh, ask staff to work with the developer to see if we can identify a way to get our full repayment um, you know, at the, at the end of the term. Uh, rather than leaving four hundred sixteen thousand dollars on the table after their their receipt of twenty million dollars in developer fee. Okay, thank you. Thank you. I think uh, Mark Victor, our deputy uh, general counsel, wanted to flag something here. I, I just wanted to provide a clarification for the board. Ms. Spirit did a great job discussing the project, but um, she mentioned that we do require a standstill agreement with the locality in order to allow their density bonus agreement to be ahead of our loan. Um, in this case, we've been negotiating with uh, the city with regard to their DBA, and there's a potential possibility that they may want to put the stencil provisions in the DBA itself. Mm -hmm. So I just wanted it to be clear that we may not enter into a standstill agreement if they do put it into the DBA, and our legal department is okay with that. Thank you, Mr. Victor. Are there any other questions from members of the board? Comments? So just a brief comment, if I may. Yes, please. Um, I think that the, uh, you know, I do believe in the science with the remediation. If, if you have uh, technically competent uh, consultants, contractors, et cetera, it should not be a problem, uh, the conditions you're describing here. And I, and I have every reason to think Santa Clara County in particular is particularly good there. I do want to underscore that one of the costs, I don't, I don't think it's called out, but when you talk about extra cost, cost per unit, you know, we are asked to lend in, in areas and sites that are not otherwise being approached by the market because of these very kinds of conditions. Mm -hmm. And this is an opportunity to remediate something that might otherwise impact the immediate community. And that's a good thing, but it does add cost. And I just always want to people to, re we, we have to be advocates for the extraordinary benefits are part of the extraordinary costs of affordable housing. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, again, I commend you on this project for what you're doing. Um, the retail space, the viability of that is impacted by things like width of sidewalks, right? Can you do a cafe? Not with a seven foot sidewalk. 10 foot, maybe. You know, so, so these are things I would like us to continue to understand that the climate, the design, and the financing actually work together and that we have the chance to move the needle a little bit on these things. So I'm happy if, if when you're seeking a motion, I'm happy to move approval of the item, uh, but I don't want to get ahead of my chair here. Well, I think you stole my thunder. Uh, I didn't see any other questions from the board, in which case I will ask for a motion to approve, which I take it you are providing. So moved. Right. Is there a second to the motion? I'll second the motion. Right. Thank you, Director Sotelo. So we have a motion made and seconded to approve resolution 2804 for the um, Meridian Family Apartments. 
And I'd like uh, Melissa to please call the roll. And first I'd like to acknowledge that uh, Director Avila Farias has arrived. So calling roll, Avila Farias? Yes. Ms. Cabildo? Yes. Chair Cervantes? Yes. Ms. Grant? Yes. Ms. Lamon? Yes. Mr. Henning? Yes. Mr. Russell? Aye. Mr. Fiegels? Yes. Ms. Sotelo? Yes. Director Velasquez? Yes. Mr. White? Yes. Mr. Williams? Yes. Resolution 24-08 is approved. Thank you very much, Shante. Thank you very much as well on the developers from Rome. Uh, we're going to move on to the next item, uh, item five, for the uh, second final loan commitment. Yes. Thank you, Chair Cervantes. So on to our second request. Our second request is for approval of Board Resolution 24-09, which allows College FA to provide $3,290,098 um, in an increase to an existing approval uh, that was originally approved at 10459902 for a tax-exempt permanent loan for the Brand Haven Senior Apartments, which is a 180-unit senior unit um, in Fresno, California. The final loan amount uh, will ultimately, ultimately be 13750000 This board previously approved permanent and MIP loan financing for this development on July 9, 2020. The permanent loan approved in 2020 was for $10.5 million. Um, in the first lien loan position, amortized over 35 years with a 17-year term. The related MIP loan will be approved in the amount of four point, was approved in the amount of 4.5 and was approved to be coterminous with the PERM. Some brief details about the development are as follows. Dominus Consortium LLC is the developer. The development is a four-story 180 unit senior property with a 55 year age requirement located in Fresno, California. The development has achieved 100% occupancy and economic stabilization as of December 2023. The development did receive an allocation of bond cap, cap totaling 18.5 million, um, 9.3 million in federal tax credits and 6.2 million in state tax credits. Construction financing for the development closed on October 13th, 2020, right in the thick of COVID. And the development was still able to achieve completion in May of 2023. The development um, achieved stabilized occupancy uh, on December 15th, 2023, and is planning to convert to College FA permanent financing on April. Um, 9th, 2024. For context, I would like to remind the board that College FA staff does complete re-underwriting <coughs> of each amount of each permanent loan prior to loan closing. This is to ensure that the development's economic feasibility at original underwriting is still reliable. Additionally, we generally see significant rental rate increases over the three to four year construction period. These increases enable the completed development to leverage more debt. Maximizing the leverage of the PERM loan is always critical to ensuring that valuable subsidy resources are being used as efficiently as possible. During construction, the Brand Haven development experienced significant cost overruns related to supply chain disruptions, interest rate increases, and unexpected changes to previously approved infrastructure plans and specs required by the local fire department, which resulted in increases to construction costs of more than 10%, and an increase in overall interest costs by, more, by 73%. Overall, total development costs increased by 8.65% or $2.8 million which was covered by the developer cash during the construction period. Also during the construction period, market rents in Fresno and the allowable HUD rents um, published by TCAC increased. Multifamily staff has completed updated underwriting for the permanent loan and the final achievable rents for the development, which also includes the market uh, driven escalators, 
have been added to the um, rental rates for the development, and it does, it's also supported by our updated appraisal. Based on the analysis, the development can support a higher permanent loan of approximately $3.3 million, resulting in a recommended perm loan of $13.7 million. The resulting loan does achieve a debt service coverage ratio of 1.15 based on CalHFA's estimated interest rate of 4.65%. The loan to value for the PERM loan will be 90%, which complies with CalHFA's underwriting standards. The increase to the loan amount will cover the entirety of the $2.8 million needed for conversion. In summary, approval of Board Resolution 24-09 is requested to allow an increase of the permanent loan to $13.7 million. And with that, I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much. Are there questions from members of the board? I see uh, Director Williams. Oh, I just um, um, want to say that I had the um, honor of representing Cal FHA at their ribbon cutting. It is a project that is well designed and it's part of a master plan community with retail around um, surrounding the building. And this is just one of many uh, housing developments that are part of the master plan and uh, it's connected to transit as well. Um, I understand the cost uh, increases. Uh, we were building a, a project, another project in Fresno at the exact same time. And the fact that this project is with the increase in rents is able to cover um, this additional requested amount. Uh, I, I'm, I'm glad to hear that. Uh, but uh, I support uh, moving forward with uh, the requested additional funding to, for the PERM on this project. Thank you. Thank you, Director Williams. Sir, other, uh, Director Sotelo. Um, I, I echo uh, Director Williams' support of the project. I think it's a great idea. Um, to be able to increase the permanent loan on the project and so be able to absorb all the legitimate uh, construction-related costs. I think that's great. Um, my concern continues to be the repayment of the MIP loan. Um, I see that we are uh, getting, um, that, that the MIP loan um, initially was uh, going to be 4.3, still left on the table after the refinancing um, alternative. Now that number is 3.5. Um, however, I do notice that the developer fee um, that's being proposed, uh, the deferred developer fee, has gone down from 800,000 down to 566,000. So it's just my understanding that tax credits doesn't allow for any adjustments on the developer fee totals. Um, and neither does SIDLAC. So are we kind of, is this within their boundaries in terms of the adjustment of the deferred developer fee? Yes, and it is very typical um, during the construction phase. If there are additional funding that's needed, this developer did carry those extra costs, it would come from their fee. So this developer, that's where you see the reduction. Well, um, okay, so, um, but it looks like they're getting 318000 now. Yes. So they're they, recapturing that. A portion of, not as much as they were before. So they did give up some of their developer fee to ensure the viability of the project. So perhaps I'm not understanding it. It shows that the deferred developer fee initially was 885000 Right. Now the new deferred developer fee is lower at... Uh, 566, so they're recapturing 318,000 more. Okay, so Steve is telling me that the split on MIP actually went down due to this, to that transaction. Okay. So that they could. <coughs> sir, I'm sorry. It's Go ahead. Standard, and it goes down a like amount. Okay. So the deferred developer fee um, goes Steve, down by zero. Mr. Gallagher. Come, come on up. Um, Steve Gallagher, for the for the record, uh, everybody. So, um, per CalHFA um, underwriting guidelines, when there is a savings, it gets split 50-50 um, to the deferred developer fee and to MIP. So the MIP is actually being reduced um, by a like amount, that 318000 that you're referring to. Okay. It, it will happen at conversion if, if, um, if 
you know, the, these numbers hold in everything that we that we see in the final underwriting. Okay, I just uh, it's not clear from the staff report that um, it, it just seems that uh, the developer fee is being I recaptured think at conversion, and so um, you know part of the increased cost. I mean, part of the increased sources are going to pay that. So I just want to be right. clear about that. And I think what you're saying is the property needs 2.8 to. Uh, cover these costs. We're asking for cushion, and at the time that we go ahead and convert and get all the numbers together, we will have a final number. So that is really a snapshot of what could possibly happen, but because we're in the conversion process, um, I think we're, we're trying to, there could be savings. I think that's what Steve was trying to kind of illustrate. And <coughs> if there are savings, then there will be a reduction in the MIP and the permit. Um, the deferred developer fee. Great. So um, the numbers are kind of, uh, we're giving ourselves room to make sure that we are covering all of the costs. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Director Sotelo. Are there other questions, comments from the board? I guess I've got a couple, um, and I'll note that this may have been perhaps one of the worst windows to try to develop a project yes. in hindsight. Yes. And so in some respects, I think, yeah, it's a big increase uh, that we're talking about here on a percentage basis. <coughs> and maybe I'm a little surprised we haven't encountered this already, and maybe we will see more. So may, maybe just to give me a clearer sense, are we likely to have these kind of meeting discussion points going forward as we see projects get closer to uh, completion? Yes, and I think it should be stated that um, when this um, development was originally approved, and came to this board, our executive uh, director was able to approve deals up to $5 million. Um, and so within this time, her um, ability to approve has increased. So we would normally kind of handle something like this at the line, and we do see this quite a bit. So this is coming back to you all to see, which it, it is kind of normal to us, especially deals that close within that window of when COVID was happening we are seeing quite a bit of increases uh, due to uh, just, you know, construction costs changing, labor, um, quite a bit of locality issues, PG&E. So it is something we are seeing. Right, and I can appreciate the fire department throw, threw a curveball at the project yes. with yes. the increased water flow requirement. Yes. It, but is there a, I'm sure staff is tracking these. Mm -hmm. Are we seeing, are there other projects in this pipeline coming at us where Absolutely. we're likely to see these kinds of increases? Yes. That's what I'm saying. We are seeing them and we are um, addressing them. And But we absolutely understand that this is, this time frame has just rendered a lot of things that we probably wouldn't normally see in the market. Um, and, and we're having a lot of internal conversations about them, but being ready and understanding that this is kind of the environment at this moment. Right. And I'll note that in the original package that was approved, um, the co hard cost per unit was a little bit under 100000 which I thought was maybe a typo. <laughs> maybe we're above that now. Yes. But still on a per unit basis, this is, I would think, still on the lower still end of what we've absolutely. seen, at least I've seen here. Yes. No, oh, that's a, okay. Any other uh, questions, staff? I think Director White's got yeah. something. Just uh, a comment, and it's, it's a follow-up on a couple of discussion points around both deals. Um, we're tracking uh, just this type of phenomenon in terms of uh, increases in our MIP loan um, because of COVID-related issues. I'll put on the table, uh, we should look at tracking the amount of MIP loan that we're not getting back because of the uh, market in terms of um, the, the tax credit investor requirements, we should start to, to look at that. Mm -hmm. Yep. Okay. Director Sotelo, yes. Uh, Mark. One of our attorneys asked me to just go to the You need to go to the podium, Mr. Vistager. Thank you very much. We want to make sure we get your voice down for the record. Hi, Mark Victor, Deputy General Counsel for Cal Um One of our attorneys was 
he was thinking that the board might have the perception that because the MIP wasn't paid off at maturity for the, the, um, for the first lien loan, that the MIP might be forgiven at that time. That's not true. No. We just want to ensure that everybody understands yeah, that the MIP still on. must be repaid. Yeah, it stays on, right. It's just the acceleration of, of when it gets paid. Right, mm -hmm. right. Mm -hmm. That's a concern. Yeah. So, and if just one second, Mr. Vicker. So my understanding was if there was a, Mark. a refinance uh, at the 15 or 17 year point, in order for that to happen, the MIP's got to get taken out. Yes. That's, yes. that's our, that our hook on the, on, the, on the future. That would be a, a case of resyndication Thank you. Yes. Okay. So it would increase those costs at that yeah. time. Yes. I appreciate Director Wright bringing that up because keeping our eye on the money in the future is important. Thank you. Yes. Any other questions, comments to the board? A, a oh, quick sorry. comment, if I may. Yes, please. <clears throat> um, we we get our data points, just samples, because of the $15 million threshold. And sometimes I, I recognize that that is really a function of giving nimbleness and agility, speed to the transactions. I would like to entertain discussions future. Do we want to see just, I'd like to see just a few more deals because I, I feel like these are textbook cases. They inform us as to whether we're really, uh, you know, what policy decisions, what impacts they're having. And I just gonna put that out there that, that I don't know what the right balance is. I feel like we're just seeing, I mean, as, as, as you elucidated here, this is happening a lot. It's great that you brought this deal forward. It illuminates a, a practice that is happening. From an oversight perspective, it would be helpful to see a, a few more data points somehow. And how we achieve that, I don't know, but I just want to offer that up. If, if I may give just a suggestion, Mr. 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 Chair, I apologize. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the things that uh, we do with Select and TCAC is oftentimes within the executive director's report, just list out some of those things uh, and what we're seeing so that, they, so that they're, you can see it, it's addressed. It's not something for approval. Uh, but at the same time, it's just more information out there, and I think that would address your issue and it's not too big of an issue for you all. So Hall, uh, thank you, uh, Director Henning. Um, I actually am saving all of these thoughts for the workshop thank because you. I do believe that this requires a much bigger discussion, um, and we have an opportunity to do just that this afternoon. So I am taking notes. And um, we'll, we'll follow up. That's going to go on the list. Great. Well, that's why I'm raising it now, because I think the, the moment the example's here, and I thank you. You're welcome. Yes, thank you. My, my recollection is that I think with the threshold we've we set for these MIP transactions, we're seeing about 85% of the dollar volume of on these issues, give or take. Okay. So, but uh, the on. point's well taken. Yeah. Okay. Any other questions or comments from the board? Uh, I'll look to see if there's any public comment on this particular agenda item. If, let's see if you could check on that, please. Sure. Um, we have an audience here. Are there, any, are there any members of the audience that would like to make a comment at this time? Okay. I don't see any hands raised. Okay. Thank you very much. So with that, then, um, I'd like to see if there's a motion to approve this resolution 24-09. I'd like to make the motion. I'll second. To approve. Director Williams and Director Avila Farias. Uh, motion made and seconded. Melissa, if you could please call the roll. Ms. Avila Farias? Yes. Ms. Cabildo? Yes. Mayor Cervantes? Yes. Ms. Grant? Yes. Ms. Lamont? Approve. Mr. Henning? Aye. Mr. Russell? Aye. Mr. Fiegels? Yes. Ms. Sotelo? Aye. Mr. Velasquez? Aye. Dr. White? Yes. Mr. Williams? Yes. Resolution 24 09 is approved. Thank you very much, and Shante, thank, thank you very much as well, please. Uh, we're going to move on to uh, the next agenda item, item six, um, approval of the annual financing resolutions. Uh, Erwin Tam, Director of Financing, will walk us through these. <coughs> it's a little bit of a passing period here. Uh, Chair Cervantes, if I may, I have uh, some information for Director Sotelo's questions about bond recycling. If just a couple of quick points. Yeah, please, go ahead. Sure. Um, so um, there was a question raised about uh, what are, so since inception, CalGVA has issued about $400 million of recycled bond volume. And currently, uh, we have uh, $190 million, of which $150 million is committed. 
Nice. So um, in the financing department, we our role is to kind of keep the shelves stocked, if you will. Mm -hmm. um, we can, we don't we you know borrowers come to us and we tell them what's available and then we issue. And so therefore, the, there's the flexibility contained within the resolution and what the boards ask are to use some, all, or none of what we have in stock, depending on what is actually available. And it's important to note that you know it's uh, the bond recycling program is set up with the rules that the IRS has given us, and it basically has said we have a six-month shelf life. So if you imagine a grocery store, right, we sometimes the produce goes south, and so therefore it becomes, it expires over six-month time, so it goes up and down. So again, we, we on the finance side um, manage what's on the shelf, and the multifamily programs division is, is the unit that, uh, is the division that's responsible for obviously uh, processing and, and issuing, uh, issuing those bonds and finding borrowers to, for it to do so. Great. Um, may I be indulged to ask two questions? Uh, please go ahead. <laughs> okay. Um, in terms of the 190 million that you have available, uh, of which 150 is committed, um, I assume that once it's committed, the, the shelf life uh, term stops. It, no, it doesn't actually. It doesn't you actually so, have to right, issue it? So, right. So it, we okay. get this constant monitoring. It's actually incredibly labor intensive, where you kind of uh, because uh, draws from from. Uh, projects and developments are slip, they move from time to time, and so we obviously uh, are actively managing the agency's uh, preserved uh, volume cap. Um, and the average remaining term on those recycled bonds, are they in the 20s? Or uh, what, what's the remaining term on those recycled bonds um, by, on average? Uh, I, I'm not sure about that. We can get back to you. But again, please, do you have a sh are you asking what the shelf life no, no, not the shelf life, but, you know, recycled bonds are... Oh, yes. The, the, the remaining right. balance of the term is somewhere in the neighborhood of 25 years or... Uh, I, I can get that back to you I in a separate report. Yeah, it's... 34, okay, yeah, so it's a 40, because they were 40 year. Um, and then the last question is, in terms of the interest rates mm -hmm. associated with those bonds, are they priced at the rate of the initial issuance or are we it's a, we it, restructure the right exactly the interest it, it allows it allows whatever the prevailing market conditions are at the time great okay thank you thank you okay great thank you chair Cervantes, members of the board good morning erwin tam director of financing agenda item six to ten collectively authorized couch face financial operations through the end of the 2024 2025 fiscal year the purpose of these resolutions is to authorize the executive director to proceed with the business of the agency through its single family and multifamily lending programs. These resolutions authorize, but do not obligate the executive director to take the actions within each specific resolution. These re the resolutions authorize staff to act within the authority given underneath the California Health and Safety Code to enact the various financing strategies. While the official titles of each of the resolutions are actually rather long. I'm going to refer to them by their basic functions. There are four resolutions that vary by production unit and by type of financing authorized, bond and not bond. The final resolution, the fifth resolution, is the, uh, is the California Debt Limit Allocation Committee, or SIDLAC, resolution that authorizes the agency to apply for volume cap for its programs. Uh, each of the following slides summarize the authority granted in this specific resolution including the dollar amounts of delegated authority, how the agency has used each of these resolutions in the past, and how College Fay communicates to this board about how it has used the authority given. So let's start with agenda item six, and this is the multifamily bond resolution. Resolution 24-10 allows the agency to finance its multifamily permanent loan production through the issuance of bonds and allows the agency to hedge those commitments. The agency previously issued bonds underneath its new affordable housing revenue bond indenture uh, in August of last year. <clears throat> the resolution continues to authorize new financings under this indenture. In addition, this resolution authorizes the agency to act as an issuer of conduit bonds and to conduct its volume cap recycling program. The issuance of tax bonds is equal to the volume of volume cap allocated by SIDLAC plus $500 million of 501c3 bonds or taxable bonds plus two and a half billion of taxable or tax exempt conduit bonds. In addition to the, re to the issuance of bonds, this resolution allows for hedges for the agency's multifamily commitments. As a perm lender, Cal FHFA extends a fixed rate loan commitment during the typical 36 month construction period. 
The agency started a strategy to hedge these commitments in 2022 that currently results uh, in a net position, a net positive to the agency uh, of over $38 million to offset the higher interest rates since then. The board receives regular reports from the multifamily division and from the financing division on outstanding bonds and interest rate swap hedges. In addition, the board will receive notifications on the issuance of a preliminary official statement. You should all have received it in, in last uh, August uh, when, we, when we posted our preliminary official statement and a written summary <coughs> after the issuance of any bonds. Staff rec recommends approval of resolution 24-10. I will take any questions. Are there any questions on the resolution? <coughs> I don't see any. Um, Melissa, if you could see if there's any public comment on this agenda item. Are there any members of the audience that would like to make a comment at this time? There are no hands raised. Great. I'd like to see a uh, look for a motion to approve resolution 24-10. I, I would move that we approve resolution 24-10. Thank you, Director. Second. Thaddeus. Second. Director Cabildo. Oh, Director Cabildo, you second it? Thank yes, you very much. Okay, motion's made and seconded. I'd like to call the roll. Ms. Avila Farias? Yes. Ms. Cabildo? Yes. Chair Cervantes? Yes. Ms. Grant? Yes. Ms. Lamon? Ms. Lamon? No? She stepped away. Uh, Mr. Henney? Yes. Uh, Mr. Russell? Aye. Mr. Fiegels? Yes. Ms. Sotelo? Um, aye. Ms. Uh, Mr. Velasquez? Aye. Mr. White? Aye. Yes. Mr. Williams? Yes. Um, even without uh, the vote of Director Lamont, the resolution 24-10 is approved. Thank you very much. So we'll move on to the next one. Thank you. Agenda item seven, multifamily non-bond resolution. This resolution allows the agency to finance its multifamily permanent loan production through non-bond sources, including through the Federal Financing Bank and through state and agency sources. In the past, the agency has both used both sources of funds to fund multifamily loans. State sources include the agency's MIP subsidy loan program. Similar to the prior resolution, the board receives reports from the multifamily division relating to its multifamily loan production. Staff recommends approval of resolution 24-11. I will now take any questions. Are there any questions on this agenda item, this resolution? <clears throat> I do not see hands. Oh, Director Sotelo. I just have a quick question. Uh, is this for a dollar amount or is this a blanket authorization? It's a, it's, it's a blanket authorization. So does that mean that um, with the MIP subsidy, uh, when, when um, Director Russell, I believe, or Director, somebody was talking about <laughs> uh, coming back and, and revisiting the cap amount of what's, what is um, evaluated um, without the board's approval? Is that this, is that this resolution? It, it basically allows, um, so once, once the board, <coughs> so it allows or encompasses both actions, right? So when the board or the executive director, uh, executive director underneath her authority commits to a, a loan, actually, well, actually, let me take a step back. This is for the permanent loan financing, so the take out. So, you know, three years after the board approves, we have to fund the actual loan, and this right. allows us to fund the loans we've already committed to three years ago. But not necessarily the award of the MIP amount. No, no. This okay. is this is allowing sort of, it's sort of the back of the house. So you, the board has already acted prior. We're al you're allowing us to make good on our promises. I, I always refer to... Um, sort of the nature of our, our lending business as making financial promises. This allows us sort of the ability to make good on our promises we made three years ago as, a, as an agency. Great. And then to the extent that there's deviations from that, then it comes back to the board for evaluation. Yeah. Like we saw today. Yeah. Okay. Great. Thank you for the clarification. Thank you, uh, Director Sotelo. Any other questions from the board? I'd like to open up to see if there's any public comments or questions on this agenda item. Do we have any members of the public interested in making a comment? There are no hands raised at this time. Thank you. Then I'll, I will look for a motion and a second to approve resolution 24-11. I'll move approval of 24-11. I'll second. Thank you, Director Sotelo and uh, Farias. We, I'll call, like to call the roll. Ms. Avila Farias? Yes. Ms. Cabildo? Yes. Chair Cervantes? Yes. Ms. Grant? Yes. Ms. Lamont? Yes. <coughs> Mr. Henning? Aye. Mr. Russell? 
Aye. Mr. Fiegels? Yes. Ms. Sotelo? Aye. Mr. Velasquez? Aye. Mr. White? Yes. Mr. Williams? Yes. Resolution 24-11 is approved. Thank you all very much. And we're on to uh, agenda item eight, Re Thank resolution 24-12. <laughs> Agenda item eight is the single family bond resolution. This resolution allows the agency to finance single family mortgages through the issuance of bonds. The agency has not been an active issuer, having last issued bonds in 2011. In 2023, the board approved a new single family bond indenture. This resolution authorizes the issuance of tax exempt bonds equal to the volume cap allocated from by SIDLAC plus one, up to $1 billion in taxable bonds. Should we issue bonds, the agency's outstanding bond balance would be reported through the financing division through the agency's bond and swap report. Staff recommends approval of resolution 24-12. I will now take any questions. Thank you very much. Are there any questions on this item or this resolution? Uh, Director Russell? Just a, a really broad overview. Uh, can, you, can you explain the intent here? This, this is obviously, if you're, if you're saying we've not been doing this since 2011. Right. What's the big story here? So, Right, so the agency in, you know, prior to the, I, I, can, I can go on for hours, but I'll try to make this brief. Um, so prior to the Great Recession, the agency was an issuer of tax exempt bonds as allocated from SIDLAC and, and, and took it onto its own balance sheet in the form of whole loans. Pri after the Great Recession, we switched our financing model from that sort of list issue of tax exempt bonds, take whole loans, the, the risk of whole loans, right? So we actually, the agency owned the individual mortgages and securitize that out through the TBA program. And so that's the next resolution that you'll hear about is a TBA that authorizing that piece. We have sort of, um, so again, what that did was transfer risk away from the agency to, the, to investors in the TBA uh, market. <coughs> what this allows us to do is we're, we're going to kind of, we've now put all of the eggs into this TBA basket. And since 2022, the Federal Reserve has stopped supporting uh, and buying these, uh, uh, supporting the TBA market through purchases. And so that we've seen the economics of that execution uh, de diminish, and which what that means is our borrowers pay higher interest rates. We want to allow the agency flexibility to re-enter the capital markets for which to finance uh, uh, mortgages for low and moderate income Californians. Um, and this is just, and we in the financing division look at it as um, sort of the best execution. And what this does is it allows not just not our single course, which what we, we've done since 2015 or so, um, but again allows the uh, what you would be approving is allows us again to do the best execution. What at any given t point in time we can make an educated decision about whether or not it is beneficial for to produce the lowest cost mortgages through the capital markets or through this. Sorry, they're both capital markets. One through the direct issuance of bonds or through this TBA market. It is it's basically again providing us the flexibility to enter uh, whatever uh, is most advantageous to the borrowers at the time. And then what what are the reporting thresholds then to the board? It says you're reporting, but are there other authorizations that you would be seeking through these transactions? This gives you the blanket authorization. Correct. And what what this is is that when we issue bonds again, it is by policy of the agency that if if and when we post a public offering document through a preliminary official statement, we would email the members of the board announcing that we have done so. After this issuance, we have a post-sale report. You'll note, you'll remember that I believe that was last September. Instead of just a written report, this was the first time out of the gates, I presented a full you know, uh, presentation at the dais here um, just to keep the, mem the board members informed as to what the activities of the board, go uh, uh, the activities of staff are. Going forward on a multifamily side, we probably aren't going to. We'll probably just file written reports. But you know, obviously, a single-family bond issuance would be of um, a significant change from prior practice, and that we would see again, and at, at the very least, an email notification prior to the issuance of uh, prior to the uh, sorry post posting of the preliminary official statement, uh, and then you would see a board summary uh, of um, after the issuance of said bonds. Yeah, I just, I, 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 this is a big deal, it sounds like to me. Like, the, we're, we're re entering a market space that we've been absent from. Right. And so, I'd, I would enjoy in a future meeting uh, some more explication of just like how this is actually proceeding, uh, even if it's uh, even in advance of the actual issuances. And that's, that's a great point. I think that we've been looking at this for quite a, uh, a while now. We, we went through the 
uh, adoption of a new resolution uh, approving the indenture of the bonds. That was last July, I believe. Mm -hmm. um, and we've been constantly, so again, monitoring uh, the performance of the TBA market versus uh, the a taxable bond execution. As you know, we don't have volume cap currently, so it would be a taxable execution. Um, so therefore, um, would love to keep you up to date on, you know, as 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 appropriate and as you you know at the frequency that you would want to, to hear from us um, about sort of the, the the you know the relative performance of both of those markets. Very good. Thank you, Mr. Tam. Other questions, Director Sotelo. Um, I would support Director Russell's uh, request around that, um, particularly uh, the creativity with which we could uh, implement the the program um, if it's direct subsidy that we could provide to developers of home ownership units that you know might be able to finance those home ownerships on the front end and then um, pass this on to the home buyers themselves just you know some creative financing around increasing the um, amount of home ownership opportunities that are being built out there um, I, I don't have a problem with um, you know the fact that there is um, you know, it's a new program, and I know that we haven't used it in a very long time uh, because the, you know, the the TBA was so attractive. Um, but I do think that um, to the extent that you can come back to the board with creative ideas, uh, both marketing ideas, uh, if it's going to be directly to home buyers or to um, help finance uh, new construction of, of, you know, multiple homeownership units, that would be helpful. That's exciting. Any other questions? So I, mm -hmm. I have one, which is, it's in the section five of the resolution, talks about foreclosure. So one of the catches of being a lender in a single family loan, like would be if the borrower is delinquent, one has to act. <clears throat> if you could talk that, through that or, obligation, please. Right, so we actually are, unlike our prior whole loans, we would still securitize through um, and have uh, our master servicer be responsible for, like, underneath. Fundamentally, nothing. This this resolution does not change our current policy or programs. This is more the how we get the money for which to 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 uh, purchase the mortgages from our lender network. So we. Um, so I take Director Sotelo's um, um, advice and direction. Um, that is a, a policy question, probably. Uh, uh, also for later on today, um, but what you're seeing here is no real particular change in terms of the operations of the agency, in terms of this, its single family division. Um, th I mean, there is some minor change obviously with the funding source, but this is again, a, the financial sort of like underpinnings of how we actually um, purchase those mortgages um, uh, from, from our lender network. Okay, All right, thank you. Any other questions? Melissa, if you could please check to see if there's any public comments on this item, agenda item. Please raise your hand if you'd be interested in making a comment. There are no hands raised. Thank you. I'd like to see if there's a motion to approve resolu resolution 24-12. Motion to approve. Director Lee thank you very much. And I'll second. Director Cabildo, thank you very much. And please, Melissa, please call the roll. Ms. Avila Farias? Yes. Ms. Cabildo? Yes. Chair Cervante? Yes. Ms. Grant? Yes. Ms. Lamont? Yes. Mr. Henning? Yes. Mr. Russell? Aye. Mr. Fiegels? Yes. Ms. Sotelo? Aye. Mr. Seeley? Excuse me. Mr. Velasquez? Yes. Mr. White? Yes. And Mr. Williams? Yes. Resolution 24-12 is approved. Thank you all very much. And now our last item. Second to the last, I guess. <laughs> we, <Yeah>. Sorry. <laughs> It's, uh, we are at, we're at the time where for single family non-bond resolution. Agenda item nine, this resolution allows the agency to finance single family mortgages through non-bond sources, such as the TBA market. As this is the current method of financing all of our single family programs, there is no limit for this amount. In addition, this resolution does not allow the agency to hold whole loans, which I prior, previously mentioned, other than the $12 million as previously authorized by the board for the SR710 project. Staff recommends approval of re resolution 24-13. I will now take any questions. Great. Any questions on this item or resolution from the board? I do not see hands raised. Are there any questions, comments from the public on this agenda item? 
Anyone interested in making a comment? No hands are raised. Great, thank you. And then I'd like to see if there's a motion to approve resolution 24-13. I'll move approval of 24-13. Thank you, Director Sotelo. Is there a second? I'll second. Thank you, Director White. Motion's made and seconded to approve resolution 24-13. Melissa, please call the roll. Ms. Avila Farias? Yes. Ms. Cabildo? Yes. Mr. Cervantes? Yes. Ms. Grant? Yes. Ms. Lamone? Yes. Mr. Henning? Yes. Mr. Russell? Aye. Mr. Fiegels? Yes. Ms. Sotelo? Yes. Mr. Velasquez? Yes. Mr. White? Yes. Mr. Williams? Yes. Resolution 24-13 is approved. Thank you. And now our last resolution. Thank, thank you, uh, Chair Cervantes. This is agenda item 10. This is the, our, the annual SIDLAC resolution. This resolution allows the agency to apply for up to $2.5 billion in volume cap for, from SIDLAC for our programs. This resolution is broader than what it has been considered and approved by the Board of Directors in prior years as it allows the agency to apply for volume cap for its single family bond programs should a pool be created at SIDLAC for such purposes. I would like to reiterate that this resolution authorizes but does not require any staff at the agency to take any action. This staff recommends the approval of resolution 24-14. I will take any questions. Yes, thank you very much. Questions? Thank you, Chair. Um, Dr. Velasquez. So my memory is a little vague about the last couple of SIDLAC meetings, but I do remember some advocacy around what it may sound like the restoration of an old um, uh, single family credit program, maybe, uh, Ms. Johnson Hall, you remember the, uh, uh, that push to, uh, and I think this emanated from the limitations of est estate tax credits and what to do with the carryover that is increasing. And of course we have a, a member from the treasurer's office. So the question here is, uh, if this resolution is aimed at taking possibly advantage of any action by the committee to, I don't know if it's restoring that program or just implementing uh, that program that will in essence create a, a set aside or a pool uh, under, a single, under single family. Is that, is that what this is aimed at? It, it only preserves the flexibility for the agency to act should actions be taken by SIDLAC. It does not obligate or require the executive director to take any action other than, you know, this this is just, again, a flexibility move uh, oh, oh. In, this, in, in the wording of this resolution. Okay, but this resolution is combined with authority also for multifamily? Is both? Yes, it's the, it's the combined single, it's the combined SIDLAC resolution for the agency. Uh, is there any reason why you didn't, it's, it sounds like it's, it's um, has there been in the past a vote to authorize just on the multifamily? On the, on mm -hmm. Yes, so in prior years it's, this. And yeah. so I wonder, uh, I'm just curious why you didn't just propose two resolutions, one to author, to just to keep the multifamily and then to, it, it just sounds like we will be voting and because conversations at CIDLA continue, mm -hmm. I, I don't feel very strong about uh, that multifamily, that, that program, that uh, single family credit program, because it's, it's still a lot of like conversation that is underway at CIDLAC. And so I, I feel, um, I have to think for a minute about supporting this resolution because it's now combined multifamily and single family as opposed to having two different. Right. I mean, I, I think <clears throat> since we haven't gone down this road in the recent past, I thought it was, honestly, it's, you know, the board is being asked to consider five resolutions. It would have been a sixth resolution for the board to consider. So I just merged it together because our, uh, the action, the authority is again for a, to us, from us, College Bay to another body. So in, in my opinion, it was just more streamlined to do it in a single resolution rather than in two separate resolutions. I, I for my perspective is I, I think that we would rather have the SIDLAC action take before you jump to the conclusion that ready to go from there. Is there is, am I missing something on timing or why you would need that preemptive action on a board that? Mm -hmm. That's where I am with yeah, that. Yeah. 
Second, right. Secretary Johnson Hall. Or, or thank you, yeah, thank you, uh, Chair Cervantes. I think um, you know the the challenge that we have is that you're we are sort of in, you know in this this influx position. What we don't want, but what I'm looking at when I'm looking at presenting to the board is um, best and worst case scenario at the same time. Uh, unfortunately. We don't know when moves are going to be made outside of, and we don't have control over those moves either. So we want to position <coughs> ourselves in the best position to take advantage of it. As you know, um, this has been percolating at SIDLAC for at least a couple of meetings. And I would say beyond what we've actually seen at SIDLAC, there's been several conversations in addition to that in the universe of affordable housing. Um, and that is precipitated by the fact that those unfortunately some of those bonds have gone unused mm -hmm. and so I um, um, we are in no means um, trying to we are not able since we are not able to sort of se second guess where the where we're going to land on this what we think is our best uh, way to proceed is to proceed with a, an offensive offense you know let's get ourselves ready so whatever which way they land we can take advantage of it and capture that for affordable housing um, for the for the state and for the administration. No, this is just ignorance on my part, but yeah. what? who in the industry would take advantage of a program like that? We're, we're giving... Well, localities uh, would, right? Well, is there, is okay. that, yeah, is that what yeah it, other localities actually, would. Other, other, loca other loca localities is what we're concerned. We believe that the folks that are best positioned to take advantage of this and who has the state interest in mind is us. Yep. Yes. And we were built to do that right from mm -hmm. the beginning. So that's what we are trying to position ourselves, is to board offense, as opposed to trying to defensively, def you know, come back at the end. And so offense is, is the best approach in my mind. So if I Chair could. Cervantes, may, I, yeah. I, I don't Yorker see, I, I don't see a, a problem with separating out the motions. I think that's completely appropriate to separate out what is our, you know, regular course of action, which is authorizing the uh, the multifamily side of it. So that's, I, if you made a motion to that, I would support that motion. Um, on the single family side, what I'm hearing is that it really is um, something where, you know, now that we're meeting monthly, I guess it's less of an issue. But let's say in the past where we were meeting less frequently during the pandemic, had SIDLAC moved to make this program available, let's say in April, and then our meeting wasn't until June, then we would have lost two months in the ability to do that. Now, you know, frankly, I don't think that SIDLAC would make a determination about a program and then automatically implement the program and close the program before we had the opportunity to apply. So I think there would always be at least 60 days to do something. Um, but I understand the, we really worked very hard to get a representative from Cal Jafe on the committees at SIDLAC and TCAC for this very reason, right? Mm -hmm. We wanted it to be clear coordination and clear uh, symbiotic mm -hmm. communication around things. So I would say I would support separating out the motions, but I would also support Ms. Johnson Hall's, um, you know, desire to be proactive in the, you know, in, in what she needs as a tool to um, improve single family homeownership development in the state. I might add a point of clarification. I don't think it's likely we're meeting next month. So our next board meeting is likely the third week of May. Okay. And I have no idea of what the timeline is with uh, SIDLAC, but no. just to make that clear. This, this, wouldn't, this wouldn't be a uh, table at SIDLAC until at least the summer. So this, this. Okay. And just from, from my perspective, uh, I guess I'll, I'll comment last. I wanted to make sure there's no other. Uh, Dr. Cavildo, do you have a yeah, comment? I guess I'm looking at the language of the resolution, and I feel, as a board member, I feel comfortable with the portion of the resolution that says basically we're only acting if the single family pool is created, right? So there's. Right. 
we're, we're creating a safeguard there, right? They can't, you can't go rogue. Like, it, this is like specifically if SIDLAC does this. So I just want to weigh in saying I feel comfortable taking action today to create this opportunity for the staff to move forward. Okay. Thank you. And Director Russell. So I'm going to come from a place of even deeper ignorance than the director down here has confessed to. Um, we are authorizing to apply for $2.5 billion in bond cap. Were we to separate these out, we wouldn't be asking for $2.5 billion in each of those resolutions. Would we have to start splitting up the baby already if we made these separate resolutions? And if so, does it simply make more sense to give this broader authorization or the broader for, to, to apply for this? You, you, you uh, yeah, I do. Um, yeah, I guess, I guess we could, yeah, you would probably need to assign separate numbers to it, depending on sort of, I guess, I'm not sure. I would actually have to ask our, our, our general counsel. Well, we, we, we wouldn't director. be doing two 2.5 authorizations. Right. I would actually say since there's only one resolution that the board can actually pass, this is your vehicle that your, I'm going to put on my parliamentary procedure hat, that your motion would actually be to strike any sort of single family authorization in this and that if carried by a majority vote a vote as an amendment to the resolution would then be voted on by the full board you really only have one resolution one vehicle because this this agenda is posted 10 days in advance so this is the sole vehicle for consideration at the, at at the board today so i i think that um that would probably be the only way around sort of what um w what i hear is the issue okay thank you I will say that again that um, I think that um, Director Sotelo actually in, in sort of the timing issue was sort of raised too is that was correct is that this board historically again uh, the February meeting was sort of the unusual one with the uh, some of the MIP deals coming in that February meeting which caused us to schedule uh, an extra <coughs> board meeting. Um, historically speaking this board has only met in odd numbered months and I believe the SIDLAC board does meet in, in an increased frequency than just every other month. Um, I want to see if, I don't know, General Counsel, if there's any comments that you have on some of these points, just to clarify for us. Um, I don't know if it will give uh, Director Velasquez or any of the other board members comfort, but I wanted to reassure you that um, for those of us who have uh, been here for a very long time, including Mr. Cooper, <laughs> we were just briefly discussing that um, this exact resolution, Director Velasquez, has been passed as a combined single family and multifamily historically. We have not ever split them out uh, in prior years. Um, and this is going back to maybe 2009, 2010. Uh, I, have, I have 09 and 10 here, but it actually goes back to before the global financial crisis. But not, but not recently. I mean, not in the, in the last, You're yeah, right, because this has never been. In. We haven't been doing single family. Right, exactly. So that's that's a con that's a concern. I mean, mm -hmm. I think that programmatically, what we're looking at, I, I, if if I may, Director Velasquez, I think that part of the the challenge is um, issuing a blanket approval of a single family program without really having uh, the specifics or the wherewithal of how we would implement that, especially since our sister agency at SIDLAC wouldn't know how it was going to implement it. Right, so. Um, that's, I think that's the, con that's the concern I'm hearing. Okay. I want to see if there's any other question or rather comments from the board on this. I think I'll chime in. I, I frankly, uh, one, one board member's opinion here, I, I don't have a problem with this resolution. It's all under one umbrella. It gives us flexibility. Uh, I think I would re rephrase, uh, Director Johnson Hall's wording, I wouldn't call it aggressive, it's active versus passive in my mind. It just gives us a seat at the table if something comes up. And I have no idea what the dynamic is. It's like it's kind of above my pay grade. But um, it just lets us be a presence there if indeed programs materialize, we're at least there, we have authorization. And granted, it would take time for us and for others to work out the programs, but at least we've got authorization and have a path to proceed as opposed to maybe being a wallflower on a topic that might be coming up. It's just my perspective. I just don't see a problem. Whether you approve it all in one or break into two, you're approving kind of the same thing. So I, I, I sort of see that as sort of fungible in a way. And I would just be, be supportive of just going ahead with this one resolution. Director Velasquez. Yeah, no, I'm, 
I'm going to support um, what we've done in the past, right? This is an important resolution. We have to do it. Um, I think what we need to do, and this is um, for the undersecretary, for Ms. Johnson Hall, to since the deliberation hasn't been final at CIDLAC, we would have to, that's outside of this board, of course, we would have to like <laughs> come to some terms about how to articulate that position at CIDLAC, given that a resolution that we would be voting yes could come up in that context. And so it's, um, I'm sorry, maybe I'm confusing everybody, but it's, it's, uh, it's it's, I feel uh, the language um, about only if a single family pool is established gives us, um, I think gives us the opportunity That's to. Right. So, my, opportunity to so just to, to move our discussion along, so are you prepared to make a motion approving this with an amendment to uh, strip out the single family language? And when we look at council here to see if that's what we can do or if this is all agendized and there's, it's in, I'm not sure how much we can have on that score. Um, so, Chair Sarban, as we can certainly um, redraft any language or strike any offensive language uh, right here and now, um, if that is what would be done, we would just need specific language fr from the board uh, as to, to what it would say. The, the other approach would be to have a motion to approve the resolution stand and see where people fall out on that. That would be the other, uh, maybe the cleanest yes, way to sir, do that. Yes. So one, in as much as that's an option, unless there's any other, actually before I do that, is can there I, any? Can I, I, I yes, think sir. that there is another option, which is give us more time. And we do have another SIDLAC meeting. We have other things coming on. It do, we don't need to take an action today on the resolution, <laughs> so far as I'm, so far as I know. Um, so we are applying, I believe, with two, our MIP 2024 programs and our authority would expire in, I believe, depending on the timing, right? It's on or about May 23rd or 20th. I believe when is our next May meeting? It's like. It's a it's uh, April 24th. No, I, I don't think we're meeting in April, so I think oh, it's, it's, it's. No, no, the, the deadline is. Okay, April. so yeah, I guess you're so we, right. So, so we guess be you within can, time. No, we I, yeah, there's, there would be limited time to. Yeah. There'd be li four days. I, right? I didn't, I, I, I was on or about, I didn't, you know, depending on how the, the prior ex authority is, is complicated. It's 60 days after the first board meeting of the agency after March 1st of any given year. <laughs> um, so if somebody wants to count right now and make sure it's May 20th, I just, that was my best guess. Um, but I, that was my concern is that there may not be another board meeting. And uh, that's hence why I wrote into the board, mem uh, into your memorandums that it was on or about. Um, and didn't, didn't make a date certain because I was not, it was not a determinative date by me. And I don't think I have the authority to determine, <laughs> to determine such dates that our resolutions actually expire. If there's the opportunity to vote on the resolution as proposed, yes, I'd welcome to have that opportunity. If, okay. it, if it does not pass, then we would have to address the issue after the fact that it did not pass. Thank you, Director Williams. I want to see if the, I don't, I want to move us to a vote because we're a little behind schedule here. First of all, we'll see if there's any public comment on this item. Uh, if you could please check Melissa. Any members of the audience, would you like to speak now? Raise your hand. I have no raised hands. Thank you. So, uh, Director Williams, are you proposing a motion? I'd like to propose a motion that we um, approve resolution 2414 as it is um, <clears throat> provided. Thank you. Is there a second? Second. Is that uh, Director Russell? That was Fiegel. Mm -hmm. oh. okay. um, yeah. Thank you very much. <laughs> My apologies. Uh, motions made and seconded to approve resolution 24-14. Uh, Melissa, if you could please call the roll. Ms. Avila Frias? No. Ms. Cavildo? Yes. Chair Cervantes? Yes. Ms. Grant? Yes. Ms. Lamont? Yes. Mr. Henning? No. Mr. Russell? Aye. Mr. Fiegels? Yes. Ms. Sotelo? Um, I'm going to abstain. Director Velasquez? No. Dr. White? Yes. Mr. Williams? Yes. Resolution 24-14 is approved. Great. Thank you. Well, 
That was a nice parliamentary discussion there. Um, <laughs> I believe that that oh, brings, brings us, uh, and uh, thank you all for your active involvement. And uh, Velasquez, thank you for bringing up the, the points. <laughs> uh, okay, yeah, with yeah. that, um, I'll note it's 11 o'clock. Uh, well, we are behind schedule uh, that we, we we're going to try to, so we're going to shift to the, uh, the workshop. Maybe if we make that transition, just take a five-minute break.